injections are the most common medical procedure given in the world today. Everyone in this room will be experienced with either giving or receiving many of them. As said, in 1984, I read a newspaper article which changed my life. It was actually a challenge that I'd been looking for. It predicted that HIV and other viruses would be spread by the reuse of these syringes, and sadly, this has come horrifyingly true. I'm going to show you a video that was shot undercover in East Africa by a medical student. He buried his phone in a notebook and asked to observe a nurse at work. Here you can see the nurse in her nice white uniform uh, taking a syringe out of a tray, but you'll notice that it doesn't come out of a packet or have the needle cover removed. This is highly suspicious. After the injection, you'll see that she puts the syringe back in the nice white tray. Now, the next patient is 18 years old, HIV, and in this case, being treated for syphilis. She picks up the syringe, which barely penetrates his skin because the needle is so blunt, because it's been used so many times. And after the injection, again, returns this syringe back to the tray. And you'll notice here that it rolls slightly to the left. The next patient is a one-year-old babe in arms. The nurse again picks up that syringe from that left-hand position and injects the baby. Not for a moment do I believe that this nurse did that for any other reason than the system or the lack of system that she operates under, which leads her to that despicable position. There is an incredible burden on healthcare workers in the developing world when there aren't the supplies that they need. So what I did was I understood the challenges that are involved in manufacturing these products in vast numbers which are required and designed a product which had the possibilities of being made on the same machinery for the same costs and used in exactly the same way. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. Get lined up here. So here's the syringe that I mentioned. You use it in exactly the same way, inject, and after use, if you try and reuse it, it locks and breaks. Now, being single use, guaranteed single use, it offers an amazing advantage over the syringe that you've just seen in that video. WHO say that 1.3 million deaths occur every year because of the reuse of syringes, which is actually twice the number that occur from malaria. On top of this, 20 million transmissions of hepatitis B take place every year. And actually, in the rankings, makes this the ninth biggest cause of death in the world. I've seen a woman be offered a syringe for free, which was going to be injecting her child, and not buy one, but afterwards walk across to a cafe and buy a soft drink, when in fact, she could have bought many syringes for the same price as that soft drink. I've seen misuse in Indonesia. I've seen recycling in Pakistan. And reuse, misuse, and recycling occur literally in every country of the world. The WHO now predict, because of the work that we've been doing with them, that an investment will pay back for the purchasing of auto-disabled syringes waste disposal equipment and waste management systems and training to the ratio of 1 to 14. This is that for every, every new dollar spent, $14 will be gained by the country which is adopting this program. In the PEPFAR program, which ran over a five-year period, in, for example, in Tanzania, one of the largest hospitals after a, the five-year period 
discovered that the inpatient stay had dropped from seven days to three. And the only physical change that took place in those five years were that they used exclusively auto-disabled syringes. Now, if you use safe syringes, that means there's less iatrogenic infections taking place. That means you need less syringes overall. In 1999, the World Health Organization, with other partners, got together and made a global policy that said that auto-disabled syringes had to be used for every single injection given, but for immunizations. This was the mainstay of the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, or GAVI. And over the last 15 years, this has been an incredibly successful step. But immunizations only represent 5% of the global market. The other 95% of the market we refer to as the curative market. And there is no policy guiding these. And that's where the problem lies. If we had safer products and a safer policy and a large strategy, we would be able to stop this problem in its tracks. And today, I'm really delighted to announce that we've taken a really major step forward in making this happen. And I'm going to ask Dr. Mary Paul Kearney to tell us what that is. Good afternoon. My name is Marie Paul Kinney, and I'm Assistant Director General for Health Systems and Innovation for the World Health Organization in Geneva, in Switzerland. You have heard about the importance of injection safety. Mark is right in that WHO is not taking that major step towards safer injection with a new global policy on safe injection and a global initiative being to be announced by Dr. Margaret Chan, our Director General, at the end of October this year. To address safety in the most commonly practiced medical intervention, it will be vital that this initiative is holistic, addressing the clinical needs, health practices, and the technological side of reducing unsafe injections. And as an example, we are inviting all syringe and needle manufacturers to attend the announcement sessions regarding this new policy in Geneva. At present, WHO is involved in one of the largest responses ever to infectious diseases and healthcare associated infection with the Ebola crisis in West Africa. While an extreme example the Ebola situation reminds us all of the importance of adequate supplies of sterile disposables and strong safety systems to reduce the risk of spreading serious illness in healthcare settings. WHO's new injection safety policy, combined with the work of many partners in implementing the policy in the next two years, will usher the world in a new era of safe, single-use syringes and needles for all injections. This will finally bring an end to needless harm to millions of healthcare workers and patients. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Paul. And in fact, this is only the third ever global initiative that the World Health Organization has issued in their 66-year history. The branding that we're going to use is Lifesaver. Here it is. So, imagine that we brand the syringes Lifesaver. What does that now mean? It means that the patients recognize which syringe to use. What about a badge that the healthcare worker wears showing that she is only going to use these type of products? What about when a country reaches the status, the agreed upon status, and they can now claim that they're a, a Lifesaver country? Now, there are many other components that make up this um, system, this new policy that we've launched, but there are six main elements. Let me show you. First of all, there's a policy, and we know how often these policies fail, and they never deliver on their, on their promise. However, supporting the policy, the, it, we have got the funders who are now obligated to only buy safe syringes and needles for 
the customers that they're donating the money to, the countries they're giving the money to. On top of that, the manufacturers who today make about 20 billion reusable syringes for the developing world market are going to have to change over to safer syringes. The ministries of health are now obligated because of the policy. The healthcare workers are going to be in a situation where instead of reusing on average a syringe four or five times, they're actually going to have the ability to use the right materials that they need to do their job properly. And the patient who gets the roughest end of the stick is now in a position where they can trust the service that they're getting. Now, all this is combined together in the holistic approach that Mary Paul mentioned. And this is what happens. The policy makes the manufacturers change to make better products. The manufacturers supply these to the market. The market has to because that's what the funders are paying them to do. That means then the patients are being delivered with safe in injections through the better syringes and needles. And all because the policy is watching the ministries of health and making sure they do the right thing. And you can see many other connections in this. And all of them, all of these connections support each other to make the system work. So if we are in global health, then we must include lifesaver policy in the future. If we're in finance, then we must make sure that these syringes are procured and supplied and used. If we're in uh, manufacturing or we have influence over manufacturing, we must take this step and move forward. If we're in the media, then we must talk, blog, film, write about it. And for the rest of us, let's tweet. <laughs> Imagine a world in the next couple of years where we will have the opportunity to see these deaths reduce massively. Imagine a patient being able to go to a clinic and know that they're going to receive the treatment, which is now going to become much more efficient and efficacious to them. Imagine the trust that will build up there. Imagine the healthcare worker now who can be valued and valuable because they know that they're not crossing this border. Imagine the ministries and the pride that they're going to be able to show to their international donors that they have made the change and reached this target. To end, I would like to paraphrase Dr. Martin Luther King and say that we refuse to believe the bank of healthcare is bankrupt.